is good for people that don't have the best memory, because ideally we're able to derive any equation that we might forget. A physics student's version of a party trick is deriving an equation from first principle. Did you guys see Carlito last night? He got so drunk he derived the wave equation and then yelled surfs up. But there are some equations that we just see so many times that you can't help but memorize them. So in this video we're going to talk about some of those equations and where you first see them. Let's get started with number one. Nope, get, get out of here! Not that equation, this equation. The first equation is actually only true for an object that isn't moving. It's talking about the energy associated with an object's rest mass. But what about an object that doesn't have mass but still carries a momentum, like light? This thinking leads us to Einstein's full equation for energy here. You can see that if we take the square root of both sides and then the limit that the thing moving comes to rest, the square cancels with the square root and you get that equation I just kicked out. Now this equation is pretty easy to memorize because we all grow up already knowing the first half of the equation. But anyone who's taken a bit of nuclear physics understands that you can use this equation to determine whether certain nuclear reactions are possible for an atom given certain binding energies. Moving on to number two. If you don't memorize the Schrodinger equation by the end of your first semester of quantum, did you even take quantum? For the time independent case, this is just an eigenvalue problem that says that if you act on a function with some operator, you get back the function scaled to some degree. The degree to which the function is scaled is something that you can observe. We should call that an observable. And in quantum mechanics, that observable is the energy, and the operator acting on the function is called the Hamiltonian. You do this so much in your first semester of quantum that I guarantee you, you will memorize this equation. Let's move on to number three. If I had nine cents every time I heard a joke about Taylor series, I'd have about ten cents. Though this isn't a physics equation, it's still an equation that you use all the time in the field. And you more than likely come across this equation your first time in your second semester of calculus, and then you'll see it again in classical mechanics and quantum when you start talking about simple harmonic motion, and you'll see it a whole bunch of times in your first computational physics class. Taylor series in physics is a fancy way of looking at a function and saying, well, what is this almost? Since we're on the topic of math equations, let's move on to number four. Divergence theorem is a fancy way of doing three integrals for the price of two. Similarly, Stokes theorem is like doing two integrals for the price of one. These theorems are a convenient way of reducing the dimensionality of the problem by exploiting some symmetry that the system has to offer. If there was ever a math theorem that your professors made you memorize, it would be this one, especially in your electrodynamics class because you use it so much. These theorems also have a lot of use in fields like fluid dynamics, which is actually how Maxwell viewed electricity and magnetism, which is why we use terms like current flowing, words that sound suspiciously like a fluid. Speaking of Maxwell, his equations are the poster child of E&M. It is impossible to go through two semesters of E&M without having his equations memorized in both differential and integral form. But in case you forget, I do have a video converting between both forms of Maxwell's equations, so... In reality, the equations should be called the Maxwell et al. equations, but that's besides the point. The first equation says that if you can draw a bunch of lines to represent how strong an electric field is, the more lines corresponding to a stronger electric field, then the lines are proportional to how much charge there is in the first place. The second equation says that magnetism is not even its final form, and that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. The third equation says that if you break a magnet in half, you get two magnets. And then the fourth equation says that there's a relationship between the magnetic field and the electric current, and it's complicated. The final equation that I think every physics student ends up memorizing at some point are the Euler-Lagrange equations. You first come across this equation in your upper level classical mechanics class, where the Lagrangian L for non-relativistic cases is usually just the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Using the concept of the Euler-Lagrange equation and the Lagrangian function, you'll derive cute results like F equals MA, and that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Not to mention the standard model Lagrangian. I mean, that thing is... thick. The Euler-Lagrange equations usually don't show their face again until second semester quantum when you're learning about variational methods. Nevertheless, they're still stuck in my head from now on. But that'll do it for this list. Let me know in the comments section what equations you just can't seem to forget, and I'll see you all there.